Hello, my name is Jeff Oakson, and I'm professor and director of the Oral Facial Pain Program at the University of Kentucky College of Dentistry. We're in Lexington, Kentucky. I also direct the Oral Facial Pain Clinic at the university, which I founded in 1977. And what I'm starting here is this is the first of a series of what will be 33 lectures on different subjects of occlusion, TM disorders, and oral facial pain. And I call it from the beginning to the end because what I've tried to do in this series is provide information for the clinician to help patients from the very early problems that are seen and that they, those that may relate to occlusion into temporomandibular disorders, which are musculoskeletal pains of the masticatory system, and then even go beyond that to talk about some of the other oral facial pain conditions that we face in the clinic uh, that you, we need to identify and be able to help our patients. And I'd like to share this information in this series. Now, I've done this series actually earlier. I did a long series in the 1990s. Uh, and I did I did the last series about 10 years ago. And see, I, I, what happens in this field is we need to spend some time to update it because things change. Uh, I am now beginning my 43rd year as a full-time faculty at the University of Kentucky. And over the years, I've seen a lot of changes occurred in this field of TMD, occlusion, TMD, and oral facial pain. And I want to share those updates with you in this series. So if you've already been familiar with some of the series, you may see some things that haven't changed much, like for instance, anatomy and things like that. But in this series, I've taken what we've learned, I think in the last 10, 12 years and incorporated into this series, which means it's an update to help us better understand how to manage our patients with a variety of different pain complaints. Uh, this evidence keeps changing. Updating is really important. Let me just share with you in this introduction, this number, this first lecture, a little bit about myself. I'm, uh, you, I, I say I'm a full-time professor at the University of Kentucky. I started my career here in 1974. And when I began here, they wanted me to be in restorative dentistry, and they wanted me to teach the area of occlusion. And I thought, well, I, I can teach that. So I learned about occlusion pretty quickly. Um, and at that time, if you happen to be around the mid-70s in the United States, the predominant thought was that if a person came to you with some pain in their face, it's because their bite was off. And if you adjust their bite to fit, the pain would go away. And so that's what I did, and that's what I started teaching. And, and what I learned pretty quickly in the first year or two is that when you do improve someone's occlusion, there are certain patients who respond beautifully, but there are some patients who don't respond very well at all, or not at all. And so when I was having these failures, it was troubling to me. So I would go to my mentors in the mid-70s and ask the question, how come I can adjust these teeth in, in, in some patients and they respond well and others they don't? And I didn't get a very good answer. My mentors would say, well, that doesn't happen to me. It must be your problem with maybe not doing selective grinding very well. I didn't like that answer because I didn't think it was very evidence-based. It was really based on opinions. And so in 1977, I started a clinic at the University of Kentucky solely for the purpose of looking at patients who were not responding to occlusal changes, but were still having their pain in the face. And that became our oral facial pain center. And as that evolved, I started to realize there are patients who would come to us seeking care for face pain that wasn't even related to occlusion or even TM disorders, all kinds of face pain. So in 1985, I decided we, I decided we need to st set up a training program for dentists. And so I started what I call then the mini residency program. And I would take about between five and six individuals each year. They would come and spend a one day a week with me, seeing patients, talking about patients. Uh, and, uh, and, and that was called the mini residency. We started that, it was, our, it was the first of the graduate training programs. In 1988, I took my first full-time resident in oral facial pain and TM disorders. And that has evolved over a period of time. And in 1994, I believe it was, we have a master's associated with that. 
1996, we were the first program in the United States to be accredited by the, the American Academy of Oral Facial Pain, which was the only accrediting body at that time. Then, when, when the Commission on Dental Accreditation decided that they would start to standardize educational programs in TMD, in oral facial pain, we were one of the, we were one of the very first to be accredited in 2011. And I'll explain a little bit more about why that's important as we move along in this, in this series. Um, what I believe is that every dentist needs to have a good understanding of how this jaw system works because we're in charge of it as dentists. And therefore, if someone walks into a practice and they're suffering with a musculoskeletal pain problem of their jaw system, we dentists have to stand up into the plate and make a difference because no other healthcare providers will. And therefore, I think it's very important every dentist understands the basic principles of jaw function, where occlusion fits, where it may not fit, and how we can manage that. Now, beyond that, we have a lot of other healthcare problems or, or pain problems, which we're going to talk about in this series that dentists need to at least recognize so they don't mistreat patients. We're going to talk about that on what. The data that we're going to talk about here, all the information we talk about, comes from two of my textbooks. I have one called The Management of Occlusion and TM Disorders. It's now printed by Elsevier. It's in its seventh edition. And the other will be Bell's Oral and Facial Pain. And it's in its seventh edition also. And that book is by Quintessence. And you'll see references to those chapters and stuff during each of the lectures that, that I'll be providing. And I think it's important that I date this because, as I said earlier, things change. And as things change in our setting, we need to update our thought processes. And so I'm going to share with you some information about updating uh, on the way here. The, the date that, that I'm presenting this is, is in the year of 2016. So if you happen to be listening to this since three or four years later, then maybe some of the concepts have already been outdated. I hope not, but certainly can be. So let's understand this is written and this is being talked to you in the year 2016. So let's begin a discussion that would introduce us to the subject. Let's say your next patient that comes in your practice is a 28-year-old female. Here she is. You don't know her. It's the first time you've met her. And you ask the simple question, why are you here to see me? And she says, my chief complaint is facial pain with limited mouth opening. And the first thing you think about, oh, that's one of these TMJ problems. I'm, doing a, I'm studying some lectures right now on it. So the first thing that you might say is, or ask yourself, what's the first question you'd ask? You'd say, well, how can I treat her? How will I treat her? Will you make an appliance? Will you adjust her teeth? What is it, the things that you could do? I'd like to suggest to you, in this, in this lecture series, that that should not be your first question. If your first question is how you will treat her, then you're missing something. You're already putting one foot into the big black hole. The first question you should ask yourself is not how you should treat her, it's should you treat her. Does she have the type of pain complaint that you can make a difference with? Because I'll guarantee there'll be people walking into your practice who have pain in their face, and it has nothing to do with the structures you spend your life dealing with. It doesn't have to do with jaw function and inclusion. And you need to know that before you take on the patient as a treatment because there's nothing worse than to treat a patient for quite a while and not get any results. So selecting the patients that you can help is one of the most critical factors. Another question that may come to your mind when this 28-year-old female comes to your practice is, can you change your occlusion? Can you treat your occlusion? Well, the answer to that question is absolutely yes. Because think about this, we are the only healthcare providers, dentists, that know how to change people's bites. We're it. Therefore, if the patient comes to us with a complaint that's associated with the malocclusion, then we need to change the occlusion to resolve the complaint. But if the patient comes to us with a pain complaint that's unrelated to the occlusion, we should not treat our occlusion. We should not treat our occlusion. We say, well, doctor, take a look. Take a look. I mean, look at the occlusion. She's got a crossbite. She's got a midline shift. She's got, she's got her, a class two, a class three relationship. I know I see that. But the real question is, is that related to her chief complaint? So it's not can you treat her occlusion. It's should you treat her occlusion. Can you verify that the pain complaint she's discussing with you is oriented or coming from, has its origin in her occlusion? 
And during this series, I'm going to share with you some of the ways you can find out whether or not it is related or not and give you some clinical basis to make that judgment on because it's not necessarily related to the severity of malocclusion. And I'll share with you the data as we move along here. So the next question says, well, why, what, what, what's the first thing you do? When a person walks into your practice, what's the first thing that patient comes in? What, how do you really think about this? Well, let's think about this as to how we would respond. Because when that 28-year-old female comes into your practice, the first thing you do is you go to your brain and you look up in your brain at all the little different files of information you have tucked up there. And you've got all kinds of files in there which are just this specific, just a dentistry. And what you do is you pick up your file on TM disorders and you'd open that file up and see what kind of information is there that would help you manage this patient's condition. But what I need to share with you is a concept. That information ball of, or that ball of information you have in your cortex there are two very important considerations. The number one is the information is incomplete. You do not have all the information necessary to treat all the patients who come to your practice. And that's because the information base is not complete for all of us. There's still many more questions about some of these particular conditions. And so understand that you may not have all the information necessary to help this patient. It's humbling, but it's true. And the second part of this is all the information you've stored in your file may not be true. It may not be true. Well, well, doctor, I know it's true. I was told this by my mentor. I read it in a book. Yeah, but that does not mean it's true. Some of the information is based on fallacy, false things. So we've got to understand that. So the question becomes is, let's take a look at this ball of information that you have in your file. And the ball of information has come to you with certain different levels of information. And I like to look at it this way just to sort of explain it. And so in the center of the ball of information you have stored in your brain is the hard, what I'd call hardcore information. These are hardcore truths. These can't be changed. Because once we understand truth, we're not going to change that. It's like the law of gravity. I can drop something and I can tell, predict exactly when it's going to hit the floor because I have a law of gravity. I can't change that. I don't care if I'm in this state or another state or another country. We have a law of gravity. Now, if I go to the moon, it'll fall differently, but there's another law of gravity. This is an element of truth that we cannot change. In dentistry, what are the truths? Well, what about anatomy? Most of us appreciate that this, mat, this temporalis muscle is a large fan-shaped muscle reaching down to the coronoid process attached to the mandible, and when it contracts, it elevates the mandible, brings the teeth together. Few of us are going to debate that and say, well, no, that's not true. So in the area of anatomy, we have certain truths, but we must appreciate even in anatomy, we don't have all the truths. For many years, we've debated the role of the later, inferior lateral pterygoid muscle. We've, we've debated the debate how much of that is it can be pulling the disc. I can show you articles that show it doesn't pull the disc, does not. I show you articles that says it does. So even in the area that should be truth, we still have some questions. And we'll be talking more about those as we move through this lecture series. But these are truths. Now, what else do we have? In the, we have another level of thinking in the ball of information, and that's what I'd call soft core information. What is soft core information? It's information that's documented with research evidence. So let me, let's look at the occlusal appliance. Okay, I can show you 25, 30 studies that show occlusal appliances seem to reduce TM disorder symptoms. Okay, so there's an element of truth in there, but do we know exactly how they work? No, not necessarily. And we'll have more to say about that in a lecture. I'll talk just about occlusal appliances. But we do understand these are useful for many patients for whatever reason. Now we draw conclusions why we think they're useful. We think they're useful maybe because they change the person's occlusion, even temporarily. Maybe they, they, they change the vertical. Maybe they change the condylar position. There's a whole lot of things that which we'll talk about later about what happens when you put a piece of plastic between somebody's teeth. But we do know they seem to be beneficial. And so there's some soft core truth here. And so we rely on that as we, as we treat patients. We rely on some of that information. It comes from our research documentation. But there's another level of information out there, and I'm going to call that information the undocumented information, and let's refer to that as the fringe. These are statements that we will make in our communities, in our dental communities, which really have no evidence. We just think this is true, and so we start to use it like that. Well, the information ball you have in your brain maybe have a lot of this information, hardcore, softcore, and fringe. It's varied, but you appreciate that some of this may be the fringe information. 
Okay, so let's put this in perspective. If, in fact, you're interested in your patients, what should be our goal? Our goal should be to uncover the truths. And how do we uncover truths? The more we know about truth, the more we'll know how to best treat our patients. How do you uncover truths? You do this with evidence-based research. You do scientific evidence to understand what it is about whatever treatment it is that's making a difference. Okay, so I mentioned earlier, just a second ago, that occlusal appliances seem to help patients with TM disorders. Well, how do they help? Well, why don't we do this? Let's take 500 patients. Let's take 1,000 patients. And let's make, with a particular diagnosis, let's say muscle pain, and let's make an occlusal appliance. Okay, what you're going to probably find out in that 1,000 patients, if you look at them, let's say, after six to eight weeks, if you look at them, perhaps 500 of those patients just, get, you know, well, let's just say, let's say 250 of those patients just got well. It cured them. Let's say... 500 of those patients got some better, but not all the way better. And let's say there was 250 of those patients who had no effect at all. Now, if you want to understand better about what occlusal appliances do, then why don't we take the 250 patients who just got well and take the 250 patients who did not get well at all and look at these groups and say, what's the difference between these groups? What's, what, why did one get responded? Oh, Maybe the, all the ones that got better had these features. All the ones that didn't get better had these features. And then what we do is say, oh, I understand something. Let's do another study and take a look at the variability or the variable that occurred between two groups. And as soon as you do that, what happens is you start to uncover the truths. And what you do is you uncover the truth. You expand the volume of truth at the expense of the soft core because it was the soft core information there. So we converted soft core information into hard truths. And that's a continued process that Evan abates. The more we learn, though, the more questions we have. But that's good. We uncover more of the truths. So what about the fringe? What should we do about the fringe? Well, is it wrong to accept fringe and just say fringe is good stuff? Sure, it's wrong to do that, but we don't want to completely exclude it because the fringe is the beginning of our learning process. So someone's going to make a statement, and from that statement, we have to understand, is this really true or not? Okay, let me give you an example. Let's say the next person, you go to a course, the next person says, I treat TM disorders by using butterflies. Butterflies. Yeah, I take five butterflies, and I put them under the left pant leg, and I tie elastic around the pant leg, and I let the butterflies flutter for 20 minutes, and then we do that three times a week for four weeks, and all the TMD goes away. Now, the first thing you think is, whoa, that's crazy. I mean, yeah, that's not going to work. I mean, there's no logic to that at all. Some of you would take that approach. Others would say, wow, what kind of butterflies do you use? I need to know that. Now, wait a minute. Before you accept this treatment as some kind of a truth, we need to do an experiment on that. So let's take the information of using butterflies to treat TM disorders and take a group of people and take 20 individuals with the same TM disorders and put butterflies under one of the pant legs of 10 of them and not the others. And then see what happens after two or three or four weeks. Now, what you might learn is the people that have the butterflies under the pant legs really had a reduction of symptoms. And you go, wow, I would have never expected that. I wonder what's going on here. What happens at that moment in time? You've just increased the research documentation. And this fringe information moved from fringe into research documentation. Something happened here that was beneficial. We don't understand why. So we have to do more studies. What is it about the flutters of butterflies under a pant leg that makes a difference? Or what you might also say is, well, that doesn't work. And if that works, then take this fringe information and get it out of your brain. Don't confuse your brain with information that has no clinical or scientific support. Now, butterflies is a good example. But what if I told you this? I had this fancy electrical device, and I put electrodes on this muscle, and I'm recording its activity. And if you do it this way and get this much, the patient will respond. Well, that's a little bit more difficult for us to accept or reject, I guess you'd say, because there looks like there's science. There's equipment involved. But that does not mean it's scientifically based. Look at the data. And we'll talk about this because we have many different instruments in the field of the industry treating TM disorders, which really hasn't got a scientific base. But it's fancy, and there's lights and buttons and things that we like. We have to understand that, especially if our patient's treatment, the treatment of our patients, is in the best interest, which it needs to be. We need to ask ourselves a question. How will we treat our patient? 
with the most scientifically based evidence. In fact, let's take a look at this. How should you treat your patients? When a patient, when that 28 year old female comes to you, the first thing you should be saying to yourself is let's look at the hardcore truth. Can I successfully treat this patient by dealing with the hardcore truths? Many times you can. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you're just not enough there. So the next thing you want to reach for is the soft core information. This has some scientific base to it. So maybe an occlusal appliance is a good example. Let's make an occlusal appliance. That's not hardcore information. That's soft core information. Because, but it's pretty reversible and it works for a lot of patients. So that makes sense. But what if the patient still doesn't get better? If they still don't get better, we may have to reach for the fringe. Information that we're just guessing at that doesn't have any scientific base. But if you're going to reach for the fringe, at least know you're in fringe. Because many of the clinicians today treating patients are doing some fringy things that they think are science. And it's not. And it's not in the best interest of our patients. In fact, as I see it right now in some, in some areas, we're actually hurting patients. We're providing treatment that doesn't make a difference. We're, we're cutting down teeth that just should never have been cut down. We're charging fees that have no benefit to the patient for their chief complaint. And that would be wrong. So here's the philosophy we're talking about here. Make sure the information that you're using to treat your patient has scientific base to it. And at what level? Is it hardcore or softcore? Or if it is fringe, at least explain that to the patient. We're not too sure, but here's some things we could try for you. Okay, here's, another, here's some thoughts. It's not what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you do know that just ain't so. That's an interesting thought. Some of us are so convinced we know all the answers that we stop listening, stop, stop look, listening and reading articles to understand the truth because we already have the answers. Well, that's very, that's very dangerous, not only to the practice, but more than, more than that, it's dangerous to your patients because they will not get the best care. So why is there so much confusion in this field? And there is a lot of confusion. You, maybe you'll be listening to my lecture series where I try to bring as much evidence as we have. But then maybe next week you go listen to someone else and someone tells you about this new articulator, this new device, this new appliance. All these things are out there. And the question you have to ask yourself is, what is the truth? How much of this information is documented with science? How much of it is fringe information? You have to understand that a lot of things you hear about is a fringe information. Let me give you an example. A few years ago, a device was made, a little closed appliance was made, and it was going to be the headache cure. Cure everybody headaches. Put this in, it'll cure everybody's headaches. That's most interesting. Because if you go to the International Headache Society and look at the classification for the study of headache, and we'll be talking about this later in a lecture series on headaches, when you look at this classification, it's now in the third edition, I added up all the different varieties of headaches that we humans experience. Did you know that we experience 278 types of headaches are in the headache class of the International Headaches Classification for the Study of Headaches. 278 kinds of headaches we humans experience. And yet, we dentists have a little piece of plastic that solves everybody's headaches. And you go, wow, how, wow, those poor neurologists come to the light, be a dentist. We solve everybody's headaches. Well, you see how naive that statement is? And yet, that statement is used to sell this appliance. Don't get trapped with ideas like that when the people who produce these things are advertising. That's not true at all. Now, does that mean that appliances can't help some patients with headaches? I didn't say that. There are certain headaches which are related to jaw function, and appliances can make a big difference. But all headaches? Be careful. That's a pretty naive statement. And so when I travel around and get the opportunity to meet people in dental groups, I always ask, them, ask groups, what's your most powerful tool? What do you do the most when a patient walks in? If that was at your 28-year-old female, what would you do for them most often? And some people say, well, what I'd do, my most powerful tool is my articulator. I'd mount the cast articulator, I'd do an occlusal analysis, and from there, I would develop a treatment plan, and I would treat the patient. Got to have an, got to have an articulator to be successful treating TM disorders. And somebody else would stand up and say, no, not in my practice. My practice is my brackets and bands. You give me a patient in two years of their life and let me do orthodontics and I'll solve their TM disorder practice, TM disorder pain. That's why. That's what I do in my practice. I give them orthodontics. It's my most powerful tool. Somebody else will say, well, not in my practice. My practice is high-speed handpiece. You give me a high-speed handpiece. Let me adjust these teeth. 
or let me cut them down and put new teeth in there. That's how I treat patients. I'm a prosthodontist. I rebuild their mouth. That's how I treat TMD patients. It's my most powerful tool. So I said, well, you know, not in my practice. In my practice, it's a slow speed handpiece. You give me some slow speed handpiece with some acrylic, and I can make an appliance. And appliance is how I treat patients. It's my most powerful tool. TM disorder, you make an appliance. How can you treat a patient with a TM disorder without a closed appliance? It's my most powerful tool. And somebody else would say, well, well, not in my practice. My practice is an image. You've got to give me an image. Let me see an image like of the disc. I'll know the disc position. From there, give me an MRI. Then I can tell you what the problem is. I'll make a differential diagnosis, just displacement with or without reduction, and I'll know how to treat the patient. I have to have an image. How can you treat TMD without an image? It's my most powerful tool. And somebody else would say, well, well, not in my practice. In my practice, my most powerful tool is my prescription pad. You let me write the right medicines. I'll make these people better. That's my most powerful tool. Now, what I've just shared with you is six tools that we use right now in dentistry. And maybe I mentioned the one you use the most in your practice. I don't know. But I'm going to suggest you something. And by the way, we could talk about tools for a whole hour. That's how many tools we've developed in this field of CM disorders. What I'm going to suggest you, though, any of those six tools I just presented, they may be your most powerful tool, but it's not really your most, most powerful tool. The most powerful tool you have in treating a patient with a temporomandibular disorder is this guy right here. It's your brain. Because this is a thinking sport. This is not a doing sport. Most of dentistry is a doing sport. You know, you cut this down or you move this over here or you put this back in here, take this out. Dentistry is a very mechanical profession, and that's good. That's what patients need. But when you go moving from dentistry into TM disorders and orofacial pain, you need to be thinking first. The most powerful tool you have is how you think about the process. Because once you've been able to think about this, then you'll know what's the best tool for the patient. You see, every one of those six tools I just showed you work for the right patient at the right time. None of those tools work for everybody all the time. Therefore, you have to make a, a, a differential diagnosis to understand what the patient's problem is. You see, the diagnosis of management of orofacial pain requires a lot of thinking. And maybe that's why some people don't like this. This is truly a thinking sport to understand this. But during this whole lecture series, I'm going to challenge you to think with me about this because you have a good primary tool, your brain. It's not like your, your Homer Simpson. Homer Simpson, here's an MRI. Him. He didn't have such a good brain. You have a brain that fills your entire cortex. And what we want to do in this series is challenge you to use it to think about this. Because thinking is what's going to make you successful. Because when you look at the patients, you're going to have to make a decision on the day you meet them. Should I treat this patient? Do I have something to offer this patient with this particular pain? And that's going to be determined your success rate. So here's an important concept. The most powerful reason for treatment, excuse me, the powerful reason for treatment failure is not the quality of treatment. It's not the quality of treatment the patient received, although we dentists have a tendency to jump on that right away. What do I mean by that? Well, you have a 45-year-old gentleman or a lady come in, and you say, I've got this problem, TMJ problem, and you take a look. So what have you had treatment for that? Well, I've had all these teeth restored. I've had a full month reconstruction. In fact, it's the second time I've had this. What's the problem? I still have pain. You still have pain. So what do we do as a dentist? We look at the mechanics. There's a little slide for the most, for the most musculoskeletal stable position to the, to the intercostal position. Ah, you look at the guidance. It's not on the canine. It's a group function. Maybe there's a non-working guy contact. You go, oh, if I had done this, I would have gotten to that slide, put the guidance on the canine. What are we doing? We're criticizing the quality of the treatment as being the reason why the treatment failed. Or maybe the patient comes in and she's 22 years old. And she said, I've got pain. I've had pain for five years. What have you had? I have an orthodontics. Did it help? No, it didn't help at all. Well, we look in the mouth and we start to see, well, look at this. There's a premolar missing. And so we say, oh, no wonder you still have this problem because they took your premolars out. If I'd have done the ortho, I'd have never taken your premolars out and your pain would have gone away. Or another patient comes in and you look at their mouth and they've got all their premolars and the, pre and the orthodontics has failed and you would have said, whoa, well, if I'd have done this ortho, I'd have taken those premolars out where I could have collapsed the arch better. You see, what we have a tendency to do is blame the individual before us for poor treatment 
that's causing this problem to, to be persistent. We're blaming it's a faulty treatment. Or what about a what about a 35 year old male or female comes in? What have you had for your treatment? I've had bilateral joint replacements. Wow. Does it still have you still have pain? Yeah, that's why I'm here to see you. This is still hurting. Wow. So what do we think? Oh, maybe they're the wrong implants. Oh, maybe if they were done a little differently. Maybe it's a new implant that's being custom made. Maybe that's what you need. Whoa. Before you start thinking that the patient has had poor treatment, we you start looking at a few things because the most common reason for treatment failure is not the quality of the treatment the patient has received. In my opinion, it's a misdiagnosis. It's an incorrect diagnosis. Every day in my practice in our orofacial pain center with the residents, we see patients who have failed to have be response to, respond to treatment. It's not the treatment often. I mean, it could be the treatment, but often it's not the treatment. It's the fact that they're treated for the wrong problem. It's a misdiagnosis. And therefore, it is so critical that you as a dentist or a clinician understand the diagnosis of the problem because it's only when, so, when you can select what this patient truly has that you can make a difference in their pain complaint. And so we're going to concentrate a lot in this series talking about diagnosis. Diagnosis. It's the most critical thing you can do for the patient because it's only through di proper diagnosis that you can select the right treatment for the patient. Selecting the wrong treatment is doomed to fail. So here's some important questions. What types of oral facial pains are you going to treat in your practice? People will come into your practice and say, I have this pain. And, and you're going to say, should I treat everybody that comes in with all that pain? I don't think I would do that. Because you are doomed for failure if you treat everybody's pain. Now, it's not because you're not smart. It's not because you're not very good with your hands. It's not because you haven't pursued problems. It's because pain is complicated. I spend my entire career now dealing with chronic pain patients. Can I help patients? Can I stop all the pain? No, I can't. There are certain pain conditions we'll talk about that we don't even understand why the pain continues on a neuropathic base. I can help them sometimes reduce the pain. We'll talk more about that. But some pain problems are beyond the clinician's ability because we don't even have the understanding of what happens in the central nervous system, which changes the processing of pain. So I look at it this way. Pain comes to, in the dental office, in lots of different varieties. But all pain in the felt face are not TM disorders. There's a whole slew of structures that produce pain that someone's holding their face and it hurts. And you need to appreciate that before you jump in to do treatment. So the way I look at it is this. There are three general types of pains or patients will come with three different types of oral facial pains. The first one's dental pain. And the most common dental pains are pulpal pains. And you know what? We don't have to talk about these. And I'm not going to talk about these in this series. Why? Because you were taught in dental school how to effectively treat pulpal pain. Do a root canal. Extract the tooth. 95% successful in treating dental pains. And it is the most common pain complaint in dental offices. So we're not going to talk about that. But we will talk about this patient. He walks in and says, Doctor, I have a toothache right here in his teeth. And you take a look at it and you don't say anything wrong. And you say to yourself, okay, Mrs. Smith, well, we're going to watch this for a little while because you've been in a practice long enough to realize that sometimes you give this a little bit of time, maybe there's a little hyperemic pulp, and then it quiets down, and she comes back a week or two later, and you say, how's that toothache? And she goes, what toothache? Oh, the one up, oh, it's gone. It doesn't hurt anymore. So you don't jump into treatment. You just give it a little time. Maybe it was a little traumatized or whatever. But this patient goes back in a week to 10 days, says, doctor, that's the teeth that's still hurting. It hurts a little more now. What are you going to do about it? Well, you take a look and say, I've taken an x-ray and stuff. I don't see anything wrong with it. You have a doctor. It's a toothache, and you're a dentist. Can you help me? So you say, okay, we're going to do a little test filling. So you do a little test filling. You do a little occlusal, occlusal prep in there. You don't see anything. Put a little temper in there and say, come back in a week or two. We'll see if it quiets down. She goes back in a week or two. She says, doctor, it still hurts. It's even hurting more. That teeth right there still hurts more. What are you going to do next? And you kind of look at it and say, well, I don't see anything wrong, but it hurts, doctor. Well, um, we could do a root canal. Well, doctor, what's a root canal? Well, a root canal, we'll go in there, we'll take the nerve out of the tooth and put some filling material so it can't hurt anymore. Well, do it because this tooth hurts. So with a little bit of hesitation, you say, okay, we'll do that. So you open the tooth up, you put a little brooch in there, you pull out the tooth, pulp tissue, you take a look at the pulp tissue and you say, 
oh yeah, it either bleeds a little too much or it didn't bleed quite enough. And you say, yeah, this is dying. I'm really glad we did this for you. And you do the root canal. Except she comes back in a week. She says, doctor, it still hurts. It still hurts that tooth right there. You did the type of pain. And you go, wow. So you take an x-ray. Well, you are two tenths of a millimeter short on the distal buckle. Well, you got to redo it. So you redo it. She goes back a week later. Doctor, it still hurts. It still hurts. I don't know. And, you, and the film looks good. And the, and the film is good. And she's, doctor, she says, Doctor, what, what, what else are you going to do? What can we do now? She's, you say, well, I, I guess I could do an apicoectomy. What's an apicoectomy, Doctor? Oh, well, we're going to cut the root off and seal it so it can't have more pain. We'll do it because this still hurts. So you open up. You say, well, I haven't done one of those in a while. But you flap it open. You do a little apicoectomy. You seal it down. You give the you suture back in place. You give the patient a week or two, let him heal a little bit. Now she comes back two weeks later. Doctor, it still hurts. That did not help. I want you to just extract my tooth. Oh, oh, no, well, do, oh Mary, we, oh, I don't want to extract your tooth. You'd miss that tooth. That's right. Doctor, it hurts. Just extract the tooth. Oh, I can't extract this. This is a really good tooth. You'd miss it. Doctor, if you don't extract this tooth, I'll go down to Dr. Billy Bob down the street, and he'll extract the tooth. And you know Dr. Billy Bob would. So you say, okay, we'll extract the tooth. So you extract the tooth, and you say, oh, man, I'm glad that's over. Except next week, she's back. And she says, Doctor, I don't think it was that one. I think it's the one behind you. You see what you have here? You have a toothache that's not coming from the tooth that she's pointing to. This is called a non-odontogenic toothache. And every dentist listening to this knows who I'm talking about because it happens frequently. And I've got a whole lecture series, one whole lecture just on the non-odontogenic toothache. But I'm going to share with you during this lecture series about eight, seven to eight different reasons why teeth hurt that have nothing to do with pulps and parallel ligaments. And you need to know that before we start doing a lot of root canals before we start taking teeth out, because each one of those are treated differently, depending upon the source. But we're not going to talk about pulpal pain. And the other odontogenic pain is periodontal pain. And we're not going to talk about periodontal pain. Why? Because you learned in dental school how to solve this problem. Clean the tissue. Take the tooth out. You get rid of the periodontion. Pulp pain or perio pain has gone. And so with these two conditions, the typical reasons why patients, the most common reason for pain coming into a dental office is toothache. And we know how to treat that really well. We're extremely successful. In fact, we're spoiled because we see the results so nicely. But sometimes that's tricky because the, pain, the patient feels it in tooth. It's not coming from the tooth. Now, the next most common reasons why patients come into a dental office with pain is musculoskeletal pain. And a, and a recent study would not demonstrate that. Every sixth patient walking into a dental office in the, in the Northwest, if we ask the patient why they're there, it's because of pain. One out of six patients, they're there because of pain. What's the most common pain complaint? Pulpal pain. What's the second most? Musculoskeletal pain. We're going to call that TM disorders. So let's define TM disorders. It's a collective term embracing a number of clinical problems involving the masculatory musculature, the temporal mandibular joints, and associated structures, or both. This is a definition by the American Academy of Oral Facial Pain in the guidelines text. Okay, so that's TM disorders. In other words, what I'm saying is TM disorders are musculoskeletal pains of the masculatory system. They're not ulcers in the mouth. They're not burning mouth. They're not lesions. They're not neck pain. It's not headaches unless the headache is directly related to jaw function. It's pains that have its origin in and emanate from the masculatory structures, which are muscles, joints, not teeth. Okay, so, but then what's this thing we call TMJ? Yeah, what is TMJ? You know, here's what happens to me. It happens to you too, probably. Patients come in, they sit down, they flop down in a chair, and they say, Doctor, I've got TMJ. And one of these days, I'm going to look at one of these patients, and I'll hate myself for this. I'll say, you know, I do too. I've got two of those. I've got one here, one here. You see, TMJ is not a disease. It's an anatomical part of the human body. People don't walk into the orthopedist's office and say, Doctor, I have a knee. But they walk into us and they say, I've got TMJ. Well, we got to ask some questions about this. Now, does that bother me? Well, it doesn't bother me so much that patients do this because patients are naive. What really troubles me is my dental colleagues will call me up on the phone and say, Jeff, i got a TMJ patient I want to ask you about. I have no idea what they're talking about. Okay, it's not belly pain. 
Maybe it's not neck or back pain. It's something up here. And I'm going to suggest to you that if you call these patients TMJ patients, that you have immediately stifled your ability to help them. Because what you're going to be thinking of, they're all the same. TMJ patients are all the same. And therefore, you're going to have one tool, one treatment to treat them all. And then you're going to fail miserably because they're not all the same. There's a variety of differences. In fact, I would challenge you to do this. Take the next group of patients that walk into your practice and merely ask them, where is your pain? Where do you feel your pain? Some of those patients are going to point right there in front of their ear and says, it hurts right here. And when I open, oh, do you feel that click? And that's painful. And she or he is describing to you an intracapsular temporomandibular joint disorder. And you can call those patients TMJ patients because what you're basically saying is the origin of their pain is the temporomandibular joint. But I'll almost guarantee that a lot of those patients aren't going to point there. Those patients say, where's your pain? They're going to say, oh, it's all around here. It's more on this side than this side. And there's this big, broad area of pain. And what they're describing to you is not an intracapsular problem. It's an extracapsular problem called muscle pain. And when you start looking at the difference between muscle pain and joint pain, what you find out is some interesting data. We now have about over 6,400 consecutive patients in our database at the University of Kentucky Oral Facial Pain Center. Over 640,000 640, patients. No, 6,400 patients. And if I go back to that database and I ask the question, what was the primary diagnosis? What I'll learn is that, that, that 46% of those patients had muscle pain as their chief complaint. Joint pain, 24%. You see, muscle pain is twice as common as joint pain in a practice. In fact, that's really an important concept because on the day you meet the patient, if you can separate your muscle pain patients from your joint pain patients into two particular groups, you know what's going to happen? You're going to treat them differently. And the reason why you treat them differently is because the pathology, etiology, and management of muscle pain is quite different than the pathology, etiology, and management of joint pain. Therefore, if you can separate those patients on the day you meet them from muscle pain to joint pain, you will be more successful because you're going to pick up a different tool. You're going to make another diagnosis. The diagnosis is muscle pain or joint pain. And because they're treated differently, you will now select a tool which will better help that patient. That's called differential diagnosis. As I mentioned earlier, it's the most critical thing you can do for your patient. But it's not quite as easy as just muscle and joint pain because here's the classification I use in my textbook on oral uh, TM disorders. There are muscle pain conditions. There are intracapsular conditions. There are mandibular, or excuse me, there are inflammatory conditions. There are chronic mandibular hypomobility conditions. And there are growth disorders. All of those are TM disorders. All of those are musculoskeletal disorders of the masculatory system. But they're quite different. And if you had a patient walk into your practice with a growth disorder, don't treat it like it's an intracapsular disorder. You will fail miserably. Growth is different than intracapsular. If you have a patient walking with an inflammatory condition, don't treat it like muscle pain because muscle pain is not inflammatory. I know we're going to talk about muscle pain before. It's myositis is rare. Muscle pain is different. Therefore, what your obligation for this patient is to decide which one of the five major classifications does this patient have, does this, you know, this patient have so that you can select a treatment that will affect it. As soon as you understand that, you are going to increase in your success rate because you will select the right tool to manage that problem. And then when you become a real student of TMD, you'll begin to appreciate something. That even in the subcategories of intracapsular, you have displacements with reduction and displacements without reduction. One's a painful clicking joint. One is a closed lock, a joint that can't move. It's locked. The disc is out of place. And in my practice, I treat these differently. In fact, I have two different appliances that I'll be talking to you about, about how to manage these problems. Therefore, it's critical that I know when the patient arrives, not only that it's intracapsular, but is it a displacement with reduction or without reduction? Because it will determine the treatment that I select the patient. And if I want to be successful, I better know which appliance to pick up to use for this particular patient. In muscle pain, some of my dental colleagues say, oh, muscle pain is all the same. Call it myofascial pain. It's not all the same. There are at least five different presentations of muscle pain that will show up in your practice, all of which are managed slightly differently. 
And if you have a patient that comes to your practice with local muscle soreness and you treat it like it's a central immediate myalgia, you'll fail to get a response. You'll make an appliance and, and all of a sudden it won't work. And you'll adjust the appliance. It's still not working. And you think to yourself, man, I make good appliances. I may, You might make the best appliances in town. But if you put the best appliances in town in the wrong patients, they don't respond. Or here, this could happen. If you have a central median myalgia and you treat it like local muscle soreness, these people actually get worse. Yeah, you put the appliance on. Oh, doctor, I can't wear this. It even hurts more. This is a good appliance. It could be a wonderful appliance. Adjust it perfectly. It still may be a problem because you haven't selected the right treatment. It aggravates the symptoms. We'll have more to say about that when I do a whole series on the treatment of muscle pain. So here are all the possibilities of the classification of TM disorders. And when you look at the possibilities, you have to ask yourself the question, how can all this be TMJ? How can you call all this TMJ? See, when somebody calls me up and they say, Jeff, I've got a TMJ patient I want to ask you about. I'm thinking, tell me more. I can't help you with that description. I need to know more to give you the right tool, to give you a suggestion for the right tool to treat this patient. What does it tell us? TM disorders is complicated. It's much more complicated than we'd like, but it is. I wish it weren't. I'm not making up the rules. I'm just, I'm just trying to define the rules and present the rules so you have a better chance of treating your patients. Now, these are musculoskeletal pain conditions of the masculatory system, but there's still yet another pain group of patients who walk into your practice. And these are the non-TMD patients, non-TMD pains. You see, TM disorders is only one subcategory of oral facial pain. Oral facial pain is the broad category of anything that produces pain in the face and head area. Many years ago, I had the privilege of learning from Dr. Weldon Bell. And I will share with us some of that history when I get into those lectures on pain. But I was also given the privilege by him to help him rewrite a textbook. And so I've taken, since his death, I took over his textbook. And now it's in the seventh edition. And I have a classification for the pain, pain which is in what I call Bell's oral facial pain. I've maintained his name because I honored him as my mentor. This is the classification to use in oral facial pain. All of these are conditions which show up in the face as pain. This is complicated. This is very complicated. And you say, well, where does TM disorders fit into oral facial pain? These are TM disorders, which means these are musculoskeletal pain conditions. Or another way to say this, if a patient walks into your practice with one of these, you likely have something to offer to treat this patient, and you can go for it. But it's not all the same. But if the patient walks in and you think it's one of these, but it's one of these, it's a continuous neuropathic pain. It's trigeminal neuralgia. It's a sinus infection. It's migraine. It's a trigeminal autonomic cephalgia. It's one of these over here. Then you know what? Your treatment will fail miserably. And that's what makes it so complicated. And that's why we have to respect the fact that all this is out there. Now, I don't believe all dentists need to understand all of what these pain conditions are. But I think dentists need to understand where they fit into this, which is treatment of TM disorders. And I believe every dentist needs to have an understanding of treatment of TM disorders because it's the second most common pain complaint in the dental practice, and it's one only dentists treat. If you have a T temporomandibular disorders, don't go to orthopedics, don't go to rheumatology. Don't go to plastic surgery. Don't go to otolaryngology. Come to a dentist. Therefore, I think every dentist needs to understand the basics of where occlusion, joint stability, orthopedic stability, and pain is associated. But I think we have to appreciate all these other conditions are there. And one of the really wonderful things that's happened in, our, in, the, in, this, in, in the last 10 years or so is that the Commission on Dental Accreditation has now established guidelines for managing and treating oral facial, excuse me, for the, for the educating dentists about oral facial pain. And as I mentioned earlier, the first available time to become accredited was in 2011. We were one of the very first programs at the University of Kentucky to be approved, to be accredited. And what that means is that every program is now standardizing what you have to know about pain. And this is evidence-based. At this time, I believe there are 12 programs in the United States that offer two-year graduate training programs in oral facial pain, and it's standardizing 
what we know about pain, which is really good for the profession and really good for patients. Because I will get phone calls all the time from, from a patient email, and it'll basically say, Doctor, uh, I, I have TMJ, and the TMJ problem here, where can I go? And I live in Timbuktu. And, and I, so I think to myself, where can I, how can I send this patient? Where can I send this patient to? And I don't know. Because if I say, well, go to your phone book. Look up somebody that has TMJ in their phone book and go to one of them. I have no idea what kind of treatment they're going to receive. None. They might receive some hardcore treatment. They may receive some fringe. I can't do that. But in the future, you're going to see in our major communities, I'd like to think, somebody who's scientifically based, trained in oral facial pain. And I can look down the list saying, go to Bob Smith. He's in your community. He's had an oral facial pain program. And that's exactly what we need professionally. It's exactly what our patients need. So we don't mistreat patients. Because we are healthcare providers. Our main role in life is to help our patients suffer less. And we're a part of a team. This thing called pain, as we'll talk later, crosses all the boundaries of medicine, of dentistry. I mean, there's pain in pediatric dentistry. There's endodontic pain. There's prosthodontic pain. There's oral surgery. All kinds of pain. It also crosses all the boundaries of medicine. And so we have to have a better understanding of all of this in the best interest of our patients. So let me just share with you, just as we close here a little bit, about what I've tried to do in this lecture series. There's 33 lectures, each one about an hour long. And I've grouped them into about five, six, six groups, I believe, maybe five groups. Group number one, the first group I'm going to talk about is seven lectures, seven hours of lecture, each one individual. I'm going to talk about the normal anatomy of the joint, how it functions, what normal anatomy is, the etiology of TM disorders, where does occlusion fit, where it might not fit. I'm going to talk about orthopedic stability in the masculatory system and how we achieve orthopedic stability. I'm going to talk about the fact that we dentists have five different positions that we want to put our patients' joints in. Let's talk about how could we have that. So I have a whole series on looking at what we've had here. How much of that is science? How much is that is anecdotal statements? And we're going to talk about understanding intracapsular problems. Because you cannot treat a dysfunction of the joint until you understand function. So with all this first section, these first seven lectures in group one, it's going to be talking about some of the problems and things that we, that we have as dentists dealing with TM disorders. The next group is going to talk about understanding oral facial pain, where I'm going to talk about the complexity of pain, and it is very complex. I'll talk about the neuroanatomy and the neurophysiology of oral facial pain, which you need to understand some if you're going to treat pain. I'll talk about the history of the concepts we've had in pain over the years, or understand pain referral, which I believe is the most common reason for treatment failure. I said this, the most common reason for treatment failure is not the quality of treatment. It's a misdiagnosis. What's the most common reason for misdiagnosis? In my opinion, it's pain referral. You have to understand that when a patient comes to you and they point to some area that may not be where the pain's coming from, that may be a site, not a source. And I'll go on a full explanation in group two under this lecture. The next thing I'm going to do is talk about, okay, once you have understanding of this, how do we evaluate the patient? How do we evaluate the patient by establishing the proper diagnosis? There's five lectures here. It begins with what's the classification of oral facial pain. And I'll go through all those subtypes we just talked about. How you take a good history and do an examination for your patient. That's critical to gather the information so you can make a differential diagnosis. We talk about seven different keys that can help you differentiate muscle pain from joint pain. And then we're going to talk about another way you can differentiate pain, diagnostic and therapeutic injections. Sometimes you can inject certain areas that will block pain. And I'm going to show you in two lectures, muscle injections and joint injections, and give you videos on each of those injections. The next thing we'll talk about will be managing TM disorders, which is what most people want to do. They want to manage their patient. In fact, some people want to say, just put that first. Just show me how to manage it. I don't believe you can effectively manage patients' pain unless you understand what's going on, what's causing the problem, what's the etiology, what's the pathology. So during management, we'll talk about managing muscle pain. We'll talk about management intracapsular pain. We'll talk about the occlusal appliance. I'm going to give you some ideas on how I would fabricate our appliance, and that may or may not be useful. But once you have the appliance in there, what happens you know, how do you solve the problem? And when an occlusal appliance reduces the patient's symptoms, what do you do next? You know, there was a time where we said, as soon as that appliance worked, well, you got to change the occlusion because there must be something wrong with the bite. Well, occlusion is one of about eight reasons why occlusal appliances reduces the patient's symptoms. 
And we're going to talk about that because you need to know that before you start irreversibly changing someone's occlusion. We'll talk about that in group six or group four. Group five, evaluating other types of orofacial pain conditions. So I got five lectures here that at least make you aware of things like headache, different headaches, migraine, tension type, and other kinds of headaches. We'll go through a lot of different headaches so you can better appreciate what's going on there. Even if that's not a primary patient that you're going to treat in your, in your practice, you'll know what these look like so you can get them to the right people, right? Healthcare providers, internists, neurologists, etc. But there's some of these patients that you can manage if you step, if you want to step out into the field. Episodic and continuous neuropathic pain, a real problem we face today in medicine and dentistry because we don't understand all the mechanisms. You need to identify who these patients are so you can pet it, set up a better, a better acceptance or a better thought process on how this patient responds. And then the last group, I'm going to talk about some things that are outside a little bit more. Like, for instance, there's orthodontics therapy and TMD. How are they related? What's the diagnostic considerations of the non-odontogenic toothache? What, what on this lecture is going to be talking just about toothache of non-dental origin, but it's based on all the other lectures I've given on other sources of pain and how they can be felt in teeth. Occlusal appliances. I put together a series just looking at all the appliances I've seen over my years in my career and what some of them do and what some don't do. And are all these reversible? Do they Are they reversible or not? And I'll show you some things when we put appliances and figured it was a temporary thing. It's, it's not reversible or it is reversible. And yet it caused malocclusions, which led to major problems. And we're going to also talk about the use of Botox in dentistry because Botox does have a role in certain dental areas. And I want to share with you what I think that is. I'm not talking about aesthetics here. This is going to be just talking about the function of the jaw, dystonias, and sometimes for pain. Okay, so that's an introduction to everything we're doing. I hope some of this information is useful for you. I hope you'll find it interesting, and perhaps you'll find time to spend some time looking at all these with me. I hope it's going to be something that will be useful for your patients, because any benefit from this lecture series is only, is only positive if it has a positive effect on your patients. Because once again, we're healthcare providers, and what our role in life is to reduce the suffering of your patients. Therefore, I believe, I'm hoping that this effort I put into these 33 hours of lectures will benefit you, but also benefit your patients. So I look forward to hearing or seeing, or I look forward to you listening to some of these in the future, and perhaps meeting you at a meeting, a program, or a national meeting or such.